All right, good morning, everyone. My name's Randy Kutcher. I'm uh, from Saskatchewan. I'm really grateful Ken invited me down to the field day. This is my first field day at uh, the Smart Farming Smarter site. But we've been working with Ken for a number of years on a number of projects. So he's given me uh, a few minutes to talk about some of those projects. Um, I, I feel a little uh, far from home, so I'm not sure if that makes me an expert. I hear the farther from home you get, the, the more you're an expert. But I, I don't know a lot about how you guys farm down here. I've been told you have good rotations. So I've been put down to talk about groovy rotations. Uh, in Saskatchewan, our, some of our rotations are pretty short, and I think as you go north, we get much more into wheat canola country. But I understand down here, especially for the folks under irrigation, you have a much longer or I would say better rotation if you have at least four crops in your rotation. So I'm a pathologist. I, uh, I like plant disease. I know you probably don't, but uh, I find it quite interesting. And I'm looking at ways that we can mitigate disease or avoid disease. And one of the best ways is longer crop rotations. Unfortunately, sometimes folks feel that they don't make maximum return that way. But uh, biologically, it's a great way to deal with many of the diseases that we have. So I just want to talk a little bit about this study behind us. This is year one. It's really just a setup stage. Um, I like to do rotation studies. In a previous lifetime, I was at Agriculture Canada Melford for many years, and we did quite a number of rotation studies. Some of them had been started before I even got there. At the Scott Station, they have a bit of a long-term study that's over 100 years old, looking at uh, wheat fallow to begin with, and I don't know if they modified it too much, but you can gather a lot of information if you can do long-term studies. The problem is it's really hard to get funding for long-term studies these days. So what we're calling this is crop sequence. It's uh, really a three-year study, although we're going to manage it out over five years, so we'll repeat it basically two, three-year studies. Um, so we will not have, you know, four-year rotations and then another four and another four because that would take 12 years. But hopefully we can generate some reasonable data to give you a better idea of the consequences of growing wheat or barley um, on the various crops that we have here. At Saskatoon, we have nine different crops, things like canary seed, flax, oats. Uh, here, I think, Ken, you have the base, the core set, which are wheat, uh, barley, canola, pea, and corn. I really want to put corn in the rotation. And I know some of my colleagues are shaking their head. Oh, we don't grow corn out here. I'm like, oh, we don't need any corn. But that, that is probably the worst case scenario for fusarium head blight. So that is the reason we want to look at this uh, across the prairies. We've got two Manitoba sites. We've got some Saskatchewan sites and Alberta sites. And as uh, Ken said this morning, Ken, uh, corn is coming. I mean, where I grew up in Manitoba, I never thought we would see soybeans, but soybeans have really taken over even my hometown in Dauphin. Uh, there's a lot of soybeans when I go up to the cottage up there now. And I think we're up to almost half a million acres of corn in southern Manitoba. So it's becoming a reality. And we know from the experiences in Minnesota and, and other places a little farther south, uh, it's a little bit of a toxic mix growing corn with wheat. So that is kind of our base treatment, I guess you could say. Uh, to see what are the consequences if we grow a lot of corn and then try and grow wheat uh, adjacent or on top of that stubble. So what we'll do next year is seed this perpendicular. So we'll seed the same crops this way. And so we'll have each crop on its own stubble, which generally is pretty much the worst thing you can do for diseases and insect pests. So we know that. And then the third year, we'll come back and seed this whole area, maybe to Durham, Ken. I think we you know, do Durham or spring wheat on this. The, the last year we have different sites, we'll do different crops. We'll have some do barley, some do wheat. Uh, whether it's spring wheat or Durham, we'll decide which one's more appropriate. And then we'll look at the consequences of say corn, corn, wheat, or wheat, corn, wheat, or... Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm in, the, I'm in Jan Salaski's plot behind me. I guess I see my, uh, hemp there, so that's actually not my crop. <laughs> but uh, th where's our scan? The next one? It's actually all combined. Oh, it's all it's combined. The same, same design. Crop sequence, but with not some normal crops. Oh, okay. We've got uh, hemp, quinoa, maybe threw in dry beans as well. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so we will have hemp and quinoa and interesting things to look at as well. So, so th this will give us a little bit more information of what's appropriate. I mean, we already kind of have a feeling what's appropriate for managing things like fusarium head blight, but looking at a kind of a short term rotation study or a crop sequence study, we'll really be able to put some data to it because. 
despite what people think and, and uh, other rotation studies, we've never really had a rotation study looking at fusarium specifically. So that's what we hope to achieve by this over the next uh, three years and then repeat it be another three years. So we'll have, after five years, we'll have a pretty good data set from six locations across the prairies. Um, we talked a little bit about fusarium this morning. Any questions about this study in particular or just rotations in general and fusarium or any other issues? And the marijuana is for the research people. I guess that in October they'll be smoking away, I guess. Eh? <laughs> Um, I understand down here you guys do follow pretty much a four-year or longer rotation. Yeah, mm -hmm. And what are your disease issues that you can, are you concerned about disease issues? Too do you dry. Do dry, yeah. Well, that's not really a disease issue, but yeah, it, it limits the diseases for sure. How much fungicide goes on? Do you spray not for, a lot. Very little. you don't spray for fusarium yet? No. No? You don't spray your canola for sclerotinia? We have, yes. You have? Okay. So not we're, too much, so. not so much. Yeah, I spent 15 years in northeast Saskatchewan, so in the time I was there, things went from really very little fungicide, really just canola and sclerotinia, to pretty standard practice for a lot of the crops. You know, a lot of fungicide goes on it, at least one application to most crops, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. The lentils we do, but other than that, not a lot. The lentils, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the ways to mitigate inputs or limit the number of inputs that you feel you need to put on is following a crop rotation. If the economics, you know, if you think that the four or five crops you're growing can uh, make you some money and uh, drastically probably reduce the amount of fungicides that need to go on. Many other advantages, right? Uh, moisture in uh, Saskatchewan, moisture is often limiting. I guess down here I would think too without irrigation. Uh, so different crops have different root uh, depths. You can manage your moisture that way a bit. Fertility is another issue. So if you're growing uh, high Yielding crops like hybrid canola, obviously more nitrogen, but if you're growing them once every four years, you have the advantage of maybe putting a pulse crop in, so a pea crop. So that's the, the kind of work uh, that this study is about. And uh, we have done quite a bit of other rotation work in the past. We had an eight to 10 year study looking at canola rotations, canola on canola for eight years in a row versus canola once every four years, and then in between that, canola every second, canola every third year. And what we found in Saskatchewan where the study was done was, you know, black leg, it still doesn't go away with a four year rotation, uh, but it's much less of a problem. Uh, even in a susceptible variety, we can manage black leg reasonably well with a four year rotation. Uh, with a resistant cultivar combined with a four year rotation, uh, excellent management of, of uh, black leg for sure. Sclerotinia, a little different because you have those sclerotial bodies in the soil for a long time, much harder to manage. So my theory is, or my premise is that a fusarium head blight in wheat and barley is much more like a black leg of canola. That really, once the residue breaks down, a lot of that inoculum is on the residue. The risk should increase the, as you extend your rotation. Um, fusarium does have long-lived spores in the soil but those probably don't contribute in any given year to a huge problem. But when we have a you know, huge amount of, of wheat growing, so we have I think 24.7 mil, 24 million I read of, of wheat this year across the prairies, you've got a lot of residue out there. So uh, hopefully we can uh, convince people that maybe um, growing so much canola is, uh, we can get the yield up but reduce the number of acres per year. That'll help mitigate some of the diseases of canola and uh, similar with wheat, if we can add more pulses to the rotation, things like flax, hemp, quinoa, it helps to mitigate a lot of the diseases as well. So, um, talk a little bit about fusarium. Uh, when I moved to the university seven years ago, I was given cereals, which is great. Uh, I like working on wheat a lot. I do a little bit of work on barley, uh, touch on oats a bit, and they gave me flax as well. So, uh, we're working on all of those crops. Um, fusarium has turned out to be the big one in Saskatchewan. 2011, fusarium was already an issue for sure, but it became much more. 2014 was our worst, a uh, very bad year, and 2016 our worst year ever. So a lot of our work is on fusarium. The other uh, disease we like to work on is stripe rust. So actually uh, Keiko Nabatani, who's with me, is a master's student, and she'll tell you a little bit about her stripe rust project uh, on winter wheat towards the end. Um, with fusarium head blight, um, I'm not sure, I can't say it's my favorite disease because it's just really limited genetic resistance. So the breeders have made fairly good improvements in 
uh, hard red spring wheat or even CPS to some degree with uh, improving from no resistance to at least something we can call moderate resistance under most scenarios. Uh, but it's not like rust where we can find nice genes that give pretty much an immune reaction. So we're far from that. A lot of the uh, genetic resistance in wheat uh, comes from varieties that have been used or uh, lines from 30 years ago. So uh, a few lines from China, a few lines from Brazil. There's a relatively limited number of genes and they're not complete by any means. So, you know, the, the varieties are moderately susceptible to moderately resistant, uh, but it's really a, a disease you need to manage with more than just genetic resistance. And what bothers me a little bit is a, when I see my colleagues' proposals and they say, we're going to end this disease with genetic resistance. Well, genetic resistance, it's great, especially for growers. You don't need any other inputs, hopefully, than the resistant seed. But generally, it doesn't last forever. We're combining something like a good cultivar with a good rotation. That resistance, hopefully, should last longer. That cultivar should not break down for many years, as compared to if it's grown very intensively. You have the fungus out there. 24.7 million acres of, of wheat residue this fall that's going to have the fungus on it. There's going to be mutations in the fungus from UV radiation, from whatever uh, causes mutations. And certainly some of those new strains will have the ability to overcome some of the genes we're using for resistance. So I like to always argue that, yes, genetic resistance is ideal, but it's not the only solution we should be using. So if we grow the heck out of one cultivar for many years, you can be sure Sooner or later, the fungus is going to find a way to overcome that resistance. So combining it with a good four-year crop rotation or longer uh, is an excellent way to extend uh, that, that variety so it maintains resistance for much longer. And like I said, with, with canola, with blackleg, we found that uh, even the cultivars that were susceptible, um, you could get a pretty reasonable yield uh, because the blackleg was at bay in a four-year rotation as opposed to a two-year rotation or certainly canola on canola was, was really poor. So how do you handle the anthanomyces that you always have the pulse in there? You have a lot of that too, no? Right, so the question is how do you handle these diseases like a phanomyces in pea because it's very long lived and it is a really hard one. So the easy answer for us that uh, don't farm, my colleague says grow eight year rotations. <laughs> you don't want to hear that, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. But that's, that is a really a, a difficult situation. When you have soil-borne pathogens like that, club root, another prime example, there's no easy answer. You know, that uh, you need to give it time to break down unless we come up with some magic solution. And I don't see any in the near future. Those are long-term soil-borne diseases. By soil-borne, I mean the spores themselves are in the soil. They're not on the residue so much. Where with fusarium, a lot of that inoculum is coming off last year's residue or residue even from two years ago. Aphanomyces is hard. So I had dinner with Shayama Chatterton last night, and I was asking her how she's going to solve this problem. And she was, uh, you know, she's trying hard, and I hope she will succeed. But there's no easy answer for a disease like Aphanomyces uh, or club root of canola. So club root, you know, we had some resistant varieties for a couple of years, but they broke down really fast. Guys really need to extend that rotation. You can't go back to growing canola on canola or canola every second year when you have a disease like club root. That fungus just seems to break it down really fast. So it's hard, but I, I'm sure uh, Shama's going to contribute good things to managing aphanomyces in future years. Uh, other pulses are less susceptible. They're not immune, but things like fava beans are less susceptible. I don't know how easy it is to market if everybody grew fava beans, but uh, certainly that may be an option for some people. Uh, chickpea apparently is somewhat less susceptible to aphanomyces, but uh, very sensitive, of course, to ascochyta diseases. So you have to really keep on top of that if you're going to be a chickpea grower. Many chickpea growers down here? A few? Yeah. Certainly it's a uh, crop. Are you, are you seeing any difference where you go from, a lot of you guys are playing with different rotations, so I'll go like peas, then I go all the wheat beans. Are you seeing any difference between like, both peas, cereal, oil, cereal? Uh, the yeah, the question was, are we seeing differences in rotation? Say you did pea, canola, wheat, wheat was one example you used. Basically, a crop on its own stubble is pretty much always the worst. So we did some of that work at Melford. Uh, we can, I, I actually have papers. If you like reading scientific papers before you go to sleep, it'll certainly put you to sleep, I'm sure. There's some work we did at Melford and Scott uh, in the 90s that, taught, that we've shown things like that. 
Uh, there used to be a theory that, well, for a black-legged canola, a lot of the inoculum may not be coming off the residue in the first year. We didn't find that to be true. When we grew canola on canola and then put two wheats after that, that second canola crop was pretty bad off. So I think the consensus at the moment is at least do a three-year rotation, right? Uh, wheat, canola, something else. Pea if you can. In the northeast of Saskatchewan, a lot of guys are going to oat because they haven't had great luck with pea, partly because of the phanomyces, I think. Um, but extend it at least three years. But generally, no, I don't think it's uh, true that you can go back to back with almost any crop. Right? There may be some exceptions to that, but I can't think of any. Uh, in mo a lot of our studies, one of our studies, we had barley, barley. We basically had a cereal intensive rotation, a broadleaf intensive rotation, and a 50-50. So we found the 50-50 oil seed uh, uh, pulse with two cereals. So wheat, um, or maybe grow your pea before the wheat if you get a little bit of nitrogen boost, or before the canola, there's maybe a little risk more of disease. But having the pea, wheat, uh, say something like uh, uh, flax or canola, and then uh, uh, another wheat would be better than you know, back to back of any one of those crops like wheat, wheat, wheat on wheat or barley on barley. So, do you want to read about that? So, what about mixing uh, cereal varieties back to back, like barley? Yeah, that's a question I get a lot, you know, when I go to talks like this and growers would say, I know I shouldn't do wheat canola, or at least you tell me I shouldn't do wheat canola, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, what, how about I swap varieties? So we didn't know much about the varieties. You know, the companies breed the varieties now and uh, we don't know exactly what genes. There is proposals, they are developing a black leg um, scheme where you can get an idea of what's in the varieties, I think, um, or at least in general. Um, we were kind of blindly saying that, well, probably different companies have different resistance genes, but we really don't know. So uh, we were saying that intuitively that makes sense to you know, change your varieties if you're not going to change your rotation or both if you're going to have a four year rotation and change your varieties that's probably the best thing to do. But we can't really give any guidance because we don't know what's in Bear's varieties. We don't know what's in other companies varieties really, right, unless they tell us. And sometimes the breeders don't really know, you know, they, they cross the best with the best and they hope for the best. That's the way you plant breed kind of big populations. But, uh, we are getting much better with molecular markers and other technologies to actually be able to track specific genes, give them names, and know where they go. So I think in future, maybe that recommendation would make more sense that you grew this variety has a resistance gene number one this year, or one, two, and three. Maybe next year you grow one that has four, five, and six. So that you, you know, your fungal population out there, even if it's mutated for the first three, hopefully they've never seen the new ones, and then you keep swapping things around. So the Australians try and do that with their uh, recommendations for canola growing because Australia has the worst black leg. That's their main issue with growing canola apparently. So they, they do try recommendations like that and I think they are somewhat successful. Yeah. Another question over so, here? So uh, last year it was fairly dry down in this neck of the woods. This year it's really dry again. Does that mean uh, guys can push the rotations a little bit more? So the question is, you know, it's pretty dry last year, it's pretty dry this year. Can guys get away with pushing rotations? I don't want to be the one to say yes. <laughs> I mean, generally, you know, in a dry year, disease is much less a concern, right? I, I expect you're not going to say, unless this keeps up and you have rain every night like this in high humidity conditions, I think it's your risk of diseases in general are lower. But uh, certainly pushed rotations will increase the amount of residue that is infected if you do have any level of infection, right? So generally, I, you know, I, I never want to recommend pushed rotations from my point of view, but I know probably the economists or maybe your bankers, I don't know, would tell you, yeah, you should grow canola every year because you make the most money, right? <laughs> I, or maybe you don't down here, I don't know. But certainly that's the feeling in large parts of the prairies is canola is a very profitable crop. But, it's also a crop that has a lot of disease issues. And, and wheat too has you know, a lot of things we need to work on. So I, I would, as much as possible, adhere to following a good agronomic rotation. And in the long term, we talked a little bit about sustainability. I did this morning with someone that, uh, with Monica, I think it was about what's sustainable. Well, you know, how do you balance the amount of money hopefully you make with the agronomic and biological factors and and sustainability in terms of, you know, you're going to leave the farm good for your kids to farm, or are you going to really have a full of club root by the time you're done, or fusarium? So, so it's a question of balancing those things, I guess.
is Fusarium more like, is it more field-borne or airborne in terms of like, have you guys done any research on, on that? So the question is, is Fusarium field-borne or airborne? So it's, it is really airborne. Um, but my premise with this study is that a lot of that inoculum is within the canopy. So it does get airborne, it does travel, you know, it travels across the prairies. I think you guys must have seen Fusarium out here from time to time even. Um, certainly, you know, in the mid-90s, Red River Valley had a lot of problems, 93, 94. Uh, you go to south to Minnesota, they had a lot of issues with Fusarium. So you can assume it's out here. Uh, it's on the residue for the most part. Uh, the residue, of course, does get into the soil, but really it's a residue-borne disease for the most part. M the m maximum amount or the, uh, the majority of the inoculum is on the residue. So once the wheat straw breaks down, a lot of that residue, uh, the fungus should disappear. But it does have long-lived spores that are in the soil, but the amount is probably limited. The chances that they get airborne are probably pretty limited. Most of that inoculum is coming off last year's residue and the year before's residue or the adjacent crop. If your neighbor had wheat across the, the road, probably uh, some of that's coming across as well. Not miles away though. I mean, small, small amounts can come from miles, but it's like sclerotinian canola. I think they've trapped spores five miles away, although I don't know how you could do that. You can't drive five miles without seeing canola right across the prairies at all. But uh, the, the estimate was, oh, it probably doesn't travel five to 10 kilometers, but it would be like 0.0001%. Most of that inoculum is not getting above the crop canopy. So the breeders see when they breed wheat that shorter varieties uh, you know, have a bit more at risk because the inoculum only has to move from the sur surface up to the head. Where taller varieties may be a little bit less at risk, but then more at risk of lodging and other things. So I like about baling, baling straw or even tillage of the, if you notice the difference then if there isn't that. You know, it's really hard to prove in a small plot situation about burn, uh, boy, um, tillage or we did some burning studies years ago we really couldn't see much benefit to burning the stubble because often I'd say at meetings you know some way you can get that residue to break down so guys just say oh just light her up we'll just burn it uh, but we never really found that it actually uh, worked at least in a small pot situation and we did publish a paper on that with our results showing we had very marginal effect of burning we did have a good effect of tillage but not on the disease it was more moisture we ran into some really dry years Zero till really pays, pays off when you have, you know, trapping that extra inch of soil moisture in the soil. So even tillage, you know, yes, it must break down the residue. It's intuitive, but it's a little bit hard to prove that in a, at least in a small plot situation. But generally, if, because the inoculum is on the residue, the faster you can get rid of the residue and the less residue there when you plant the next crop, such as four years later, you should have much less problem, right? Baling though, or is it mostly in like the root mass and the, and the bottom? It's throughout. So I mean, baling, you'll get how much you bale off, you know, 90% of the biomass. But you're still going to have the last couple inches that are going to have spores on them as well. Yeah. So. so in relation to that, and Brian's earlier question about narrowing rotations on drier years, it won't break, that residue won't break down as quickly in a dry year. So you, if you get a wet year on the third year, you right. have a real... Oh, yeah. Good point, so good point is uh, Kevin saying that uh, you have a dry year this year, last year's residue is not going to break down as much. If it's wet next year, you may increase your risk actually. And that's what we found with black leg of canola, that uh, like in Western Australia where it's really dry, that residue's out there sometimes giving off spores for five years. Maybe not huge amounts, but some, you know. Uh, whereas in wetter parts of Australia and say Northeast Saskatchewan versus South, uh, North. East Saskatchewan versus Southwest Saskatchewan, same sort of thing. You know, we have over 400 mils a year at, at Melford when I was there, but only 250 at Swift Current. So, you know, the residue probably will be lasting longer at Swift Current. If you ran into a wet year, it could be more at risk. Yeah. So those are considerations. Ooh, lots of questions. <laughs> uh, one of the rec recommendations in quotation marks for uh, harvesting uh, wheat with uh, a lot of fusarium is to try to blow it out the back of the combine. Right. Does blowing it out the back of the combine uh, create a problem three years in the future? Yeah. So you know, should you put it, turn up the wind speed and blow out all those light kernels that are fusarium damaged kernels and leave them in the field? So it should improve your sample. But yeah, you you have a risk that you have an, another source of inoculum. I'm not sure how you know, in terms of the amount of residue and the amount of kernels you're blowing out, what the risk is. But certainly, there should be more inoculum in that field when you do that. 
and another reason to have a longer rotation so that residue can break down by the time you grow the next wheat crop, right? But uh, if you have a wet year, maybe it is contributing somewhat more than if you didn't have those kernels out there. Have you been playing with the seeding rates to try and get the crop more even and uh, shorter flowering? We, we actually have a study right now. There's a young fellow named Gur Sahib with me. Oh, sorry. So the question is, have we been playing with seeding rates? So Ken talked a lot about seeding rates this morning. Uh, we have one study where we're doing the extremes. I would have loved to have done many seeding rates, but the experiment just gets way big. So there's a young fellow doing his PhD thesis, and one of his projects is fusarium timing, which we talked about a bit. And uh, he's using two seeding rates, very low, like less than 100 plants per square meter versus 300. So uh, last year's data was not the best. His 2016 data was pretty good because we had quite a bit of fusarium that year. Um, in his study though, he didn't actually detect the effect of seeding, or at least the treatment we recommended in term of, terms of timing was the same regardless of seeding rate. So, but I mean, it's a limited amount of data. This is his third year in the project with four sites. So at the end, he'll have 12 site years, but you know, it is pretty warm and dry. I'm not sure how, well, he'll do this year. Maybe we have to do it the fourth year. Is, uh, are there varieties that are less susceptible to black leaf? Oh yeah, like black the Liberty leaf. people will claim that they never tell you to spray for black leaf. Oh, the Liberty people will never tell you to spray for black leg and canola. Eh? Yeah, they got the two That's genes. What eh? they're up here says I've yeah. never told you to spray. Yeah. Uh, I mean, good black, uh, the question I guess is, is there a difference or less, is there less susceptible and more resistant varieties for black leg of canola? Certainly canola, uh, the resistance in the past has worked very good and I think the genes they're using now are, are still very good, but it is susceptible to break down some varieties that were good, like um, Gary Stringham's program at U of A from the, I guess the 80s and 90s when we first started working on black leg, he used one called RLM3. That was a very good gene for many years. And then after a while, Gary's varieties really weren't that good anymore. The fungus changed and overcome it. Uh, so then, you know, people moved on to different genes. So if he's saying that, I expect that he's pretty confident the genes they're using in those varieties must be holding up very well. I'm kind of out of the black leg business now. I haven't really kept up. I've handed it off to a colleague and I live vicariously through him, I guess. I miss my black leg days. But, uh, you know, I think that's one instance where genetic resistance combined with a good rotation can really stave off black leg. But if guys are growing canola on canola and canola every second year, there's a lot of pressure on the fungus to overcome those resistance genes and they will break down. It's just a matter of time, right? Sometimes it's within a few years. Sometimes you get a gene that's good for 20, 30 years, but sooner or later they'll break down. It's almost inevitable. So good management practices can make those genes last longer. Randy, Sorry, can, can, can you explain, because when you say break down, everybody thinks a gene goes like this, but it's actually not necessarily the gene breaking, mm -hmm. it's the disease changing. Right. Can you explain that for people so they don't get okay, yeah. gene breaking? As pathologists, we often say the gene has broken down. So you have a good resistance gene, it doesn't really mean that someone snapped the DNA in half. But what it means is the fungus has a, a corresponding gene to any specific resistance gene in a variety, and the fungus has had a mutation that allows it not to be recognized. Generally, the plant has the gene and it's recognizing the pathogen. We don't really understand exactly how they recognize each other, but there's effectors and um, different words they use to explain the interaction with proteins between the pathogen and the host. So the, the fungus somehow has changed the protein it's using to infect and the, the resistant host with that specific gene can no longer recognize that protein or whatever enzyme that the pathogen has. So we say it's broken down, means it doesn't recognize each other. The gene really hasn't changed, it just doesn't work anymore, right? So I think you probably intuitively can picture that, that you have to keep up ahead of the fungus. You, every year you have to go. That's why we, we look through huge amounts of material from uh, the gene banks to try and find new genes for resistance that breeders can use. So just a follow-up question to that, then nature is always going to have mutation in the fungus. Like that's just going to keep happening. Yep. So the length of time a gene lasts or doesn't last, it's still on a clock of at some point it might hit and mm -hmm. the gene no longer be uh, uh, cause resistance, correct? Right. So the, the uh, comment was that eventually genes break down. I mean, to complicate matters further, there are specific resistance genes that kind of stop the pathogen right on the leaf surface, basically. 
And there's other genes we call adult plant resistance genes, which maybe aren't expressed early in the growing season, but say in wheat, when the uh, uh, plant starts to head out, uh, genes for stripe rust will be expressed. And they're usually not complete. You still see some symptoms, but they're much reduced. So there's a gene called LR34 or YR18, YR is yellow rust, stripe rust. That gene has been, it's not totally effective. A lot of the varieties that have it in a really bad stripe rust year, you'll get a fair bit of disease, but not nearly as bad as a, a variety that doesn't have it. And that gene has been around for 50, 60, 70 years already. I think uh, Peter Dick in Manitoba found that gene. My last follow-up question is, uh, is there anything a farmer can do to stop the disease from mutating? Like, is there any cultural practice or is there anything? Rotation. Longer rotations deals with a lot of these things, right? Not just disease, it deals with insect issues, it deals with fertility issues, it deals with moisture issues. But it's easy for me to say because I don't make my living from growing crops, you know? You guys have to decide what can you grow that you can make some profit on each of those crops, hopefully, and longer term uh, is sustainable for you and hopefully minimizes or mitigates the amount of disease that you have to deal with and certainly hopefully reduces the amount of inputs you need because of it, right? So if you don't have to spray for fusarium down here, that saves you another 15 or 20 bucks an acre. Right? So uh, all those things take into account longer term, but uh, it's pretty enticing, I think, when you can grow a, a 50 or 70 bushel canola crop um, and, and see a, a real tidy profit from that. But uh, long term, can we keep doing things like that? I don't know. Okay, I don't know if I'm not running in there. Yeah, I guess I am. I better give some Keiko a bit of time. So uh, I've talked a little bit about our, our one study with uh, Fusarium uh, head blight timing. So we are looking very specifically, we're looking at growth stage 59, which is when the head comes out of the boot, versus 61 when you see the first few anthers, versus 65 when uh, it's kind of full flower, as we call it, the anthers are still on the head and then 69 when the anthers are turning white. So kind of following up on a little bit of conversation we had uh, this morning, when do you spray? The hard part, as you pointed out, well, you've got heads all over the place. So that's why the idea is if we can get the seeding rate up, you'll have less tillering, you'll have more heads in that 61 to 65 period. And what Gutcher and the grad student who's working on this has found that um, actually 61 to 65, not a lot of difference. He's getting a little less fusarium damage kernels with 61, we're a little less toxin with 65. And the reason we looked at this is because there were some Japanese papers saying, well, you should wait three weeks after these flowering stages because they found they could really cut their toxin in half or down at least. So we've also included a treatment like that. We haven't seen so far the same thing as the Japanese have seen with reducing the toxin, but they had really dramatic effects. That fungus, once it has infected, is still growing, colonizing the seed, or what would have been the seed, and uh, producing more and more toxin. So stay tuned, we'll, we'll tell you our results in a year or so, but uh, we are working on some of those issues you talked about this morning. So, Keiko, do you want to say a few words about your Stripe Rust Winter Wheat Project? Uh, we're kind of wired up here, I don't know if we can oh. hand you those. Yeah. <laughs> You're tough on you. I'll, I'll just hold on to them. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Keiko. I'm, as he told, he told everyone already, I'm a master's student from University of Saskatchewan working with Randy. So this is my second year master program and I just wrapped up the uh, winter wheat and fungicide application trial last year, which was to see that if the fungicide application in the fall for the winter wheat has any benefit uh, in regard of controlling any stripe rust and ultimately increasing the yield of the winter wheat. So this study based on the previous study that was done between 2010 and 2013, which we found that, or they found that, the four of certification alone actually improved the yield of the winter wheat. So we wanted to see if does it actually happen and if it, how, how how good improvement is in comparing with the spring fines application and no fines application at all. We also look at the different varieties of the winter wheat that has a different resistance against the stripe rust. So we can see that if there's any difference between the different resistance and uh, four fines applications. So we had a location in Saskatoon, Indian Head in Saskatchewan and Lacombe and of course Lesbridge. So four locations from 2015 to 2017 which the last year. And while we found this, we did not see any improvement in yield. So 
the oh yeah, the four finds application by itself. We saw the improvement only by the spring finds application. And what we think what happened is that we had a very heavy stripe rust uh, epidemics in 2010, 2011 that caused a lot of inf infection and during the fall on the seedling stage of the winter wheat. And when we sprayed it, maybe that actually helped them to overcome the stress of getting infected by stripe rust during the fall. But we haven't seen the same amount of disease pressure for last almost 10 years, not seven years, six years. So we could not replicate the results. And it's a very, any iotic uh, increase that we could have seen by the fall fund application, it heavily depends on that disease pressure that we can see in the fall. So that's why I found. We also looked at the four different varieties of winter wheat, Bellatrix, uh, Osprey, Moss, and Radiant. So Moss and Radiant are supposed to be resistant to stripe rust, and the Bellatrix and the Osprey are very susceptible. That's Bellatrix and Osprey, they are susceptible all, all year round or all the side years. What we found is most was all force resistance most, uh, most of the time. And one thing that we found interesting was the Radiant. That's the winter, var winter wheat variety that has a resistance gene called wire 10 which has been uh, resistant in Canada, Western Canada for a while. But we saw that the breakdown of, the, of that wire 10 gene in Lethbridge first. And we didn't, s we saw some re breakdown in Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan as well. We didn't see a lot of breakdown in Lacom, Alberta, which is very interesting because it's closer compared to Saskatchewan and Lethbridge. So it was very interesting. But even in Lacom, we saw that slowly the where the end of the resistance gene of radiant was broken down by the stripe press over time. So it was kind of interesting to see that there's a breakdown of the wire 10 gene, resistance gene in the wheat that was kind of slowly happening, not just one year, it was happening next year, it stopped not like that. And also the different location has a different breakdown, not schedule, but breakdown timing that, that's, that was happening that we found very interesting. So yeah. So for fine suffocation, it could work, but not very often. If he, see, if he keeps seeing that uh, moderate or not so high stripe rust did this pressure in the fall, it's not very guaranteed. That's what I found. Anything else? Yeah, okay, any questions from the study? It's okay. Good. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. If there's any other questions, we've got a, maybe a minute or two before Brian. Otherwise, I don't think stripe rust really has been an issue for a while down here either. Our last, our only really bad year since I've been uh, in the business was 2011 when a lot of folks didn't really know how to react to stripe rust in Saskatchewan because we kind of snuck up on us. Um, we certainly find it every year when we do surveys, but not very many fields have warranted spraying, but it's something that we're somewhat prepared for now. We can give you a recommendation as when you should spray and maybe even what varieties, because we have some varieties that have adult plant resistance genes and they're very good. And Keiko touched on a little bit how, how varieties or how the resistance changes in varieties. So. All right, I will be quiet now. Okay, drum in, thanks.